Hello and welcome back to the Kielda Observatory podcast. I'm Ian Brannan. I'm joined by Director of Astronomy at the Kielda Observatory in Northumberland, United Kingdom, Dan Pye. And coming up a little later, another Dan in this episode, our astrophotography guru, Dan Monk, will be joining us to explain more about the things that you can look out for in the night sky as we head into the winter months and some top tips on how to get those perfect shots. You have to take a long exposure, so you have to leave the camera open to light for, for a long time. Uh, a typical image during the daytime will only be a fraction of a second, but at night time you're talking anywhere from 10 to 30 seconds of an exposure. Plus, Kilda Observatory needs your help too. We're raising money for a brand new wind turbine. Find out why that is absolutely crucial to the observatory going forward. But first of all, let's have a look at what's happening in the night sky over the coming few weeks or so, and one or two other developments in the world of astronomy and space in general. And uh, our main guest, of course, is Dan Pye, Director of Astronomy. Hi, Dan. Uh, you have been on your trip travels. In fact, you've been to the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, which uh, was fantastic. Tell us about that. Yes, yes, I have. Yes, um, that was an exciting trip. Yeah, went to see rockets and stuff. Saw a rocket launch. That was nice. Um, it is, as you imagine, there's flames come out of the bottom and the rocket goes up. And then sometime later, you hear a bit of noise um, and then it disappears into the sky. So that was good. Um, and yeah, went to Kennedy Space Center and uh, saw the saw the Saturn V rocket, which is always an impressive thing to see, and and the space shuttle as well. Because I think the thing is with the space shuttle is that you have this impression of it in your mind. I don't know if you're like me, but like I I, I felt like it was like aircraft size, but really it's it's huge, big objects. I mean, planes are big anyway, but this thing is just so humongous and wide. Um, but I guess it had to be to be able to fit the. Um, to fit the Hubble Space Telescope in because that's quite a big a big unit in itself. So that was exciting. And uh, when we watched the launch, we watched it with um, uh, a, a, a great chap who told us a great deal about the site, about the layout of the Kennedy Space Centre. He used to be the education director there and he now works with the Aldrin Foundation. His name is Jim. And um, he he had some great commentary on the whole affair, so that was that was an exciting experience. And who knows, maybe Jim will join us on a podcast in the future and talk about stuff. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah, it'd be great to hear from Jim. He's an interesting guy because he uh, worked with NASA for quite a long time on their education program, uh, not just educating children, but educating astronauts as well. So uh, he knows quite a lot. And of course, being part of the Aldrin Foundation, I think, uh, as you can imagine, he's uh, well connected. Uh, let's talk about where we're at at this point in the year now, as far as Kildra Observatory is concerned, as far as astronomy in general is concerned, because we will be noticing the nights rolling in now getting towards these events that come around, the landmarks in our diaries like Halloween and Bonfire Night and whatever. You want. Obviously, we know we've got dark nights then, but that means we have dark skies earlier as well. Great time of year for astronomy now. Yeah, that's it. It is the darkest time of year. We are approaching the darkest, darkest time of year as well, of course, um, which is a great time of year to do some stargazing. And at this time of year, we've still got the Milky Way in view as well. So always nice to get out and see the Milky Way um, when it starts to get dark. If you go to a dark sky area without the moon in the sky then you'll have the opportunity of being able to see that stretching above your head and starting to swing around to the west now and it'll start to swing around even further west until we get right into the depths of winter and then it um, starts to get quite low on the on the eastern horizon um, so it becomes less interesting at that time of year for uh, for looking at the milky way but it's still a spectacular time to see it right now um, and loads of planets in the sky as well so it doesn't even have to be dark in order to be able to get some really good views of the planets we've got things like jupiter still there saturn's still there mars is rising quite early on a night now as well and mars is such a spectacular object to look at through a telescope but arguably my favorite planet to look at through a telescope actually is mars and the good news for fans of mars and martians alike is that um, mars is getting slightly brighter as we go through the next month or two as well so um, that's going to make for a better view of it and more noticeable red glow to that star that we see in the sky yeah so mars is getting closer to us and on the 8th of december that's going to be its closest approach to us this year so of course as it gets a bit closer it gets brighter and brighter and brighter um, and at its closest approach it's not that far away it's only 38 million miles away 
<laughs> so that's quite close to us, right? Um, and and when it's close, <laughs> when it's close like that, that's a really good time to observe Mars because, at the, and this is one of the things that makes Mars my most favourite planet to look at, is when you get to see Mars um, and you get to see it well, you get to see some of the surface features. And that is one of the most spectacular things because to me, being able to see the physical surface of another world, this is the only other world that you can really see the surface of other than the moon uh, in the rest of our solar system. So being able to see the surface features of another another world is just absolutely spectacular i just i love it so so that'll be coming around the um the 8th of december is when that's at its closest approach but to be honest i looked at it with one of our telescopes last week and i could just about see the surface coming through so wow that's good and and there's news about mars as well this month because the curiosity rover is is still there digging away beavering away trying to find signs of of life or, or anything like that um and th- they found what what they're describing as an intriguing salty site and <laughs> this is what they found and, and and they think that there there could be further evidence here of, of maybe some water or 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 maybe there's something has gone on in the past on Mars that we, maybe we weren't previously either sure of or certainly had proof of. Yeah, that's it. I think the, the the real key is to try and uncover whether or not Mars did have a liquid water past and whether or not it was very much Earth-like in its very early stages. And I think by, by doing its uh, uh, constant research into that area that it's in right now, the Gale Crater, it's got some real good... Um, uh, chance of stumbling across this evidence that we need to to figure out whether or not it was a potential sustainable place um, very early in its existence. And the, the key for that is, uh, in particular now, is that in recent studies this year, we found um, evidence, suggested evidence of plant life which existed prior to what we originally assumed plant life to exist. And that's really exciting because that means if life did find a catalyst very early on in Earth's existence, maybe that was within the first um, billion years, within the first half a billion years, that's a real good thing that suggests that maybe, just maybe, if Mars's conditions were as we think they were about uh, a billion years after its existence, uh, sorry, after its creation, then maybe there is a chance that actually life did get started in some way, shape or form on Mars. And maybe it's still there. Maybe it's gone below the surface of the planet. Because if I was a little life form, I think I'd want to be hiding out of that cosmic dust and the penetrative UV. I think I'd want to be underneath the uh, the surface of Mars in what could be um, a, a place locked down deep where there may be deposits of methane as well as some sources suggest um, so yeah I think I think um, there's some really exciting stuff coming from Curiosity and and the Martian team at the moment and it's impossible to to understate the significance of finding any life isn't it because so far we've found no proof of life anywhere and when we're saying that that could be a microbe it could just be a little germ or something that they find that and that is life a life from another world and that would be absolutely vast we're not talking about finding green men and hidden cities or some kind of town like the jetsons going on underneath the surface of of mars just anything just any little bug or as i say something microbial that we can't even see with our eyes would be you know a massive massive discovery yeah, it would be. Yeah. Just anything. Um, that, because that means that there is a, a recipe to replicate those things that you need um, to, to, to catalyze life. And life, remember, on this planet evolved from the very basics of those microbes, those early life forms, which then found a complex way of being able to replicate themselves to become the, the complex things that we see on our planet. And um, there's such a diverse uh, uh, range of life on our planet. And I think this is something that, that people really need to consider when they're thinking about life and why, why we search for life and why there might not be um, people who can communicate with us on Earth-like beings. If you think about um, our planet as a whole and its, its, its history of life, there's been billions and billions and billions of life forms of varying different types on our planet. Um, And only one of them is really 
able to uh, to contemplate its place in the universe as such, as we know anyway. I mean, dolphins, who knows? Dolphins are, are weird. If you believe Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, then they are a higher being. Um, so who knows what they think? But from our perspective, it's only humans out of the billions and billions and billions of life forms that have existed on our planet that have been able to contemplate uh, the universe, in which case there could be unbelievable amounts of life out there it might just be that it is these tiny microbes the earliest forming stuff that formed um, very simple cell uh, singular celled organisms anything like that is, is really a good um, thing but it also might not even be the way that we think it is it might not be that life is carbon based it might be that it is silicon based it might be that something else um, is 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 taking the shape of life elsewhere in the universe. We just don't know. We, we, these are questions which hopefully the James Webb Space Telescope and other missions will start to resolve very, very soon. I think it's the most exciting area of astronomy is, is this region, this astrochemistry or astrobiology, as you might want to call it. And something else that NASA are up to is uh, research into unidentified aerial phenomena, as they're calling it. You might know them as UFOs, but they're actually called UAPs, as far as NASA are concerned. Um, it's um, following on from the Pentagon's announcement in July. It's going to create an office to track reports of, of UFOs or UAPs. And they've got a group of 16 researchers who are going to spend the next nine months studying uh, these reports that come in from the public to sort of see if there's anything to it or not. Do you think this is some kind of admission that maybe there is some something flying or things flying in our in our atmosphere that we we aren't fully aware of or or perhaps uh, it's just nasa sort of humoring the people who are who are making these reports yeah i don't know to be honest I, I, part of me thinks that it may be that they are humoring um us but um i don't know because the thing is with the uh, with the with the ufo thing is it's it, it's such a controversial area of um of of research if you want to call it that um why could you imagine if if suddenly something somebody had seen something and then it was classified as um as uh, as as alien um, could you imagine the fallout of that and the consequences of that um would just be unbelievable and almost uncontrollable as well and I think that's the thing that the that the, the, they really are considering, and the reason why a lot of this stuff has been behind closed doors for such a long time. Um, and I think, to be honest, I think what what we're getting may even just be diluted information in itself. That's a little bit of a conspiracy <laughs> there, but I think that yeah, I, I I don't think that they'll ever admit that there is things which could be of alien origin unless we have definitive proof um, that it's there and a reason to notify the world that it's there as well. Um, like suddenly there was a spaceship in the sky and everybody across County Durham saw it. That would be a difficult thing to to, to cover up. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> this is the thing with with mobile phones these days i think if we had like a close encounters experience it would be filmed on mobile phones and on facebook before you know it especially if it was in county durham i imagine as well i think we'd know about it don't you <laughs> <laughs> you're listening to the kielda observatory podcast Energy is a big topic in most of our lives at the moment, uh, not least the cost of energy. But what about getting electricity to one of the remotest locations in England, which is where you'll find the Kielder Observatory? Kielder Observatory is off the national grid and uh, with increasing demands needs an increasing amount of electricity. And that's why we've recently launched a crowdfunding initiative to try and raise enough money to buy us a second wind turbine. Now, the wind turbine is one of the most prominent features of Kielder Observatory. From the moment that you open your car door upon arriving, you will hear the wind turbine with its swishing noise, a kind of noise emanating across the landscape. Was that, was that a good representation, Dan? That was a really good impression. 
Yeah, it was. Yeah. There you go. I can add uh, wind turbine impersonator to my CV. Um, however, when I met Stan at Kildra Observatory a few days ago, um, would you believe it? It was the only day in many people's memories that there was absolutely no wind at all, completely still at Kildra Observatory. And so you just have to use your imagination. Let's uh, head up to the observatory now and talk more about wind turbines. Well, we are on location at Kielder Observatory. Uh, guests are, are yet to arrive. I'm with Director of Astronomy, Dan Pye. Um, now, we, we planned to come up here and talk all about the wind turbine, which is usually a really audible thing that you, you notice as soon as you get out of your car, this, this whooshing noise. Um, Dan, tonight, I think it's the first time I've ever, kn- <laughs> I've ever known it. <laughs> not move (laughs) and it's absolutely deadly silent just listen how quiet it is you might hear some rain um it doesn't often stop spinning does it (laughs) it it really doesn't know this is this is a a, such a rarity i mean being on the top of a hill it is a very windy site and we do get a lot of uh, wind generated energy from our wonderful wind turbine but that's not happening right now at all in fact Uh, it's just it literally is i've never seen it that's that's still for, <laughs> for quite some time. Um, I mean, it looks nice. It's there. Uh, and it's slightly less scary than when it's going like the clappers. But, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's not doing much. The thing is with the sound, though, is the sound is, is, it is the soundtrack of the observatory, I always think. And mm. when it's not there, it is quite noticeable. It makes the place feel a little bit eerie. It is very quiet and absolutely pitch black, as you'd imagine. Uh, for an observatory that's why it's here there's there's no light pollution at all and can barely see our hands in front of our own uh, faces really at this moment but the reason we're talking about the wind turbine is um is because you're looking to get another one um tell us about why you've got the wind turbine first of all obviously it's a very noticeable thing that people see and hear when they when they first arrive one of the first things they see probably because it's right next to the the radio telescope as well um but there is a very good reason why the wind turbine is here. It's it's not uh, it's not just a, a sustainable living for for the observatory. Of course, it is that as well. But um, it's it's vital. Yeah, it is because we don't have any mains. Mm. There is no mains electric. We are in the middle of the forest and running power lines up here just for us would cost so much money. And there's no real. Um, business case for that i guess so instead the the logical thing to do was to find a sustainable option and the sustainable option was to install a really big wind turbine that was capable of being able to charge some batteries and we've got 24 batteries uh, in a rack inside the observatory and the wind turbine charges those uh, mixed with a little bit of solar power as well. The entire top of the observatory is covered in solar panels. So those two things together charge the batteries and then the batteries deploy the energy to the observatory. But the great thing is, is there's a constant supply, usually when it is windy, <laughs> of energy to top those batteries back up again. But that's not happening right now. And then additional to all of that, we have a, a diesel backup generator as well. The problems that have occurred is that we've got bigger and now we've got bigger and added a new building and we operate more equipment. We've got sometimes uh, five, six electronic telescopes functioning all at the same time, in addition to the radio telescope, in addition to projectors, in addition to boilers and all sorts of other stuff. So we are drawing a lot more energy than we can really put into the observatory. So we need to um, bolster that, add another power system to give us that extra boost and keep us going. And so this is why now you've launched um, a crowdfunding initiative to, to try and raise the money required, which is over £30,000, isn't it, to, to install another wind turbine. Will that be very similar to this one? It's going to run sort of, what is it, where, is it, where do you think it's going to be positioned and what, all that kind of thing? That's a really good question. You don't know yet. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't know. I, I honestly don't know. Um, we, 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 we... Um, we can site another one on site mm-hmm. somewhere. Um, we haven't uh, identified the location yet, 
but we can cite one another one on site. And yeah, there is a cost for the turbine itself and then there's a cost for the base as well. There's a big concrete base that you can't mm. quite see underneath the turbine because you just have this tiny little footprint of concrete that you see at the top. But that structure is what holds that weight and stops the thing from blowing away essentially. And sometimes, I mean, during Storm Arwen, you had 100, 150 mile an hour winds up here running this wind turbine. It would, if it hadn't had the support system in place, it would have just taken off and cut through trees and all sorts. But luckily, that big base keeps it in place and the base is quite an expensive part of the whole process and quite an expensive part of the whole uh, um, the whole piece of kit. So yeah, that's what we want, another one of those with a little concrete base to put it on. Obviously we talked about the electricity, that you, the telescopes are powered electrically, you've got TV screens, got computers, there's lighting, there's kettles to boil, so there's quite a lot of electricity used here on the site, isn't there? There is, yeah, yeah, there's a heap of electricity used. And we have um, reduced the amount of stuff that we have switched on. We've increased the efficiency of the things that we have switched on um, by replacing the lighting for LED lighting and um, made all of the adjustments that we can do to really reduce uh, the amount of energy that we consume, but we still have that, we still have that need. And if we want to increase uh, the project even further and start installing new uh, additional bits and pieces, for example, um, interactive screens that people can touch and get involved with and that's going to give us additional power consumption that we don't have um so yeah it's a, it's a real crucial thing that we need in order to, to to continue operating is this additional power solution and are there plans to to further obviously add to to this power You're obviously using more power than when you first got the, the wind turbine are there plans in the future to further develop the the site and, and you're going to need more power for that for that reason as well there isn't any fixed plans. We're always open to, to talking about ways and means to, to extend the site and to increase the, the site. But we don't want to really push it too far. And there's a few reasons for that. Um, one of the main reasons is that if we give it, if we add too many buildings here, it's going to start to take away from the, the, the magical kind of setting that we have. It's just going to look like a, a collection of buildings instead of the architectural installation that it is, the architectural sculpture that it is. But when we first opened that first building that we constructed, um, it was never really it was never really designed to operate the way that it is right now. We were designed to run infrequent events, monthly events, bi-weekly events, uh, really infrequently. Not many people. Uh, through the doors at all and nowadays we do 735 events plus 735 events every year uh, is what we're running and up to 25 uh, a little bit more than that thousand guests a year so we've really ramped up our operation to its max uh, to be honest right now um, and all of that of course has come with an additional need for power Heading into the winter now, though, what what sort of events are going to be happening here at Kildra over the, the coming uh, few weeks and months for, for people to particularly look out for? So this is our busiest time of year now, where we're usually booked out right through until March time, if not a little bit further on. Um, it's certainly all of our late night events, they're all, they're all gone, because um, this is the depths of winter that we're moving into. This is the darkest skies that we get here in the UK. So we want to get people up here and looking at stuff through telescopes, hopefully. Um, and we've got a range of events which are changing in the new year as well. And um, we've got some new events added to the calendar for next season. Um, and of course, the continuation of uh, of kids events, which have now moved to their winter schedule. So we've got our searching for aliens events. Um, we've got our searching for stars events. Um, the rocket launching now has come to an end because of the weather and the light and stuff. Um, so that bit, that gets replaced with a slight alternative for the kids events through the winter time. Um, and and yeah, just uh, go on the website and see what's available really uh, is my advice at this time of year because there is just so little availability left um, right up until the end of the year and then moving on to next year as well. So there's a great range of the usual stuff that we do um, and also at this time of year and then um, the early equinox next year is uh, is a good time of year in which to potentially see some aurora. So mm. always a good time of year to, to try and book up and maybe come to Northumberland to see that stuff. And on the subject of the aurora, we'll speak to uh, Dan Monk, who is 
our Director of Astrophotography at Kielder Observatory in just a moment with some tips on how to uh, photograph, uh, if not the aurora, other things in the winter night sky. That's coming up in just a moment. Uh, if you'd like to find out more about our crowdfunding initiative for the new wind turbine and make our observatory even more environmentally friendly than it already is and uh, ensure, of course, we can keep welcoming visitors throughout the year, you can find all the information you need on the front page of our website, kilderobservatory.org is the place to go, kilderobservatory.org. And uh, thanks to everybody who's donated so far or able to support us in whatever way. And if you uh, would like to get involved as well, uh, online, kilderobservatory.org to uh, help out with our Kielder Observatory Wind Turbine Crowdfunding Initiative. Next on the Kielder Observatory podcast, let's talk about astrophotography. It's one of the topics that people love to talk about, and people love to see stunning images of the night sky, whether that's of the Milky Way, whether that's of the aurora, or even just of the moon. Uh, It is something that people want to know about and want to know how to do better. And we do have astrophotography sessions at Kielder Observatory where we can uh, look at your equipment and uh, maybe give you some tips on how to take better photos, even if it's just with a mobile phone, because you can take decent mobile phone photos, as you're about to hear in just a few moments' time. Now, the man who is uh, responsible for the majority of the stunning images that you might see on our social media and sometimes on the TV is Dan Monk, Director of Astrophotography. And I caught up with Dan in the Sir Patrick Moore Observatory at Kilda Observatory not so long back, and uh, he gives a few tips on photographing the night sky through the winter in particular. I love that the dark skies are back now. We always get excited for August coming when we get true darkness again. And now that we're in October, uh, they're well and truly back and much earlier as well. And at this time of year, I still love to image the Milky Way. Uh, people uh, often regard different times of year as better times for the Milky Way. But the reality is, is that the Milky Way is always visible, but we see different sections of it in different seasons. And probably my favourite season is autumn because we get a lovely section of the Milky Way known as the Cygnus region. And as the night goes on, the Cygnus region gets a little bit lower towards the northwest and it's in a nice position to take pictures, especially landscape photography. You can take images of a nice uh, foreground with, with the Cygnus region of the Milky Way nicely placed. Of course, it has to be done when the moon isn't out as well. Yeah, and, and I'm just looking, I've got a computer opposite us, and, and is that the image you're talking about there, where we can see the uh, Cygnus region of the, of the Milky Way there, and um, it's, uh, it's, it's appearing uh, on the skyline. We've got the, the radio telescope in the foreground there as well, a stunning, a stunning, a stunning image. And that's the, something you just get at this time of year. Yeah, that's that, that. Yeah, this time of year, it's in a great position to get that. And uh, what I love about it is, I know, I know that we can't see the picture on the podcast, but you can see here we've got these uh, dark bits that run right through the Milky Way, and these are dust lanes in our galaxy, and they're particularly prominent in the Cygnus region. So that's why I like it because it's quite a, it, it stands out quite a lot uh, this time of year. And when people uh, they, they see these these images, of course. Mobile phones are getting better, but you really need a, an SLR camera for this, don't you? And, and some proper equipment, tripod and, and all that kind of stuff to get that kind of image. And what time lapse as well? And how, how do you do them? Yeah, and first thing I should mention that smartphones are getting good enough now to do astrophotography. I always find it strange that we spend thousands on camera gear and now that a, a phone can, can do it. It's not brilliant, but you can you can do it with a phone. But if you want to do it properly, uh, you do need a tripod, a DSLR camera, and ideally a good lens. Uh, the lens is, a, is the biggest thing, actually. And what we normally recommend is, especially for landscape astrophotography, is to use a wide-angle lens, so something with a low focal length, maybe 14 millimetres up to 24 millimetres, something like that, and uh, something that has a wide aperture, so has a low f-stop, uh, normally f2.8 or below. And if you use a lens like that, uh, that does the work for you. You It collects a lot of light and it has such a wide field of view uh, that you can get these stunning images of of the Milky Way. And of course, tripod is essential because you have to take a long exposure. So you have to leave the camera open to light for for a long time. Uh, A typical image during the daytime will only be a fraction of a second, but at night time, 
you're talking anywhere from 10 to 30 seconds of an exposure. So you have to make sure that the camera is kept nice and still during the exposure. And is this a bit of trial and error as well? There's no sort of hard and fast formula for, for these kind of images. It's just sort of taking the image 20 seconds or whatever and, and seeing what it brings up and then sort of just adjusting things either way then. Yeah, it's definitely trial and error, uh, but also I think if you know your camera well, you know what settings are best on your camera. But normally it's a balancing act between uh, trying to make sure that your ISO is not too high so your images aren't too noisy and or that your exposure time is not too long so your, your stars are beginning to trail. We call them sausage stars because they, they move across the sky and if your exposure is too long, then you'll see them trailing. So it's new, normally it's a balance between uh, keeping the noise down and keeping the sausage stars to a minimum. So that's normally what I, what I focus on. But it all depends on how good your camera is as well, really. The million dollar question I'm sure that you get asked all the time is about the Aurora. Now, we've seen the Aurora here at Kielder very recently indeed, and, and people may have seen your images make the national news um, because it was a stunning image. It was a stunning Aurora. Um, I was driving through Northumberland. I managed to miss it. But anyway, that's beside the point. Um, but obviously, a, a lot of luck involved with that. But obviously, you've got your gear there. There. What, what is the key to taking a, a great Aurora pick? Firstly, finding the Aurora, I think. Yeah, yeah. For, firstly, being lucky, to be honest. Uh, it was, it was a, amazing how it happened because I was doing a talk about the Northern Lights in the observatory, we had a group of people here, and it was actually on an aurora night. Was it an aurora? It was an aurora wow. night as well. Uh, yeah, I yeah. mean, that, that, that rarely <laughs> happens, does it, that you have an aurora on an aurora night? Tell me about it. It's been years probably since it actually happened. And we, we, I finished the talk, and then we got people outside. It was, it was clear, and we were all standing on the deck. And I could see something on the horizon. I could see something kind of uh, like a, a small glow that I knew shouldn't be there. And I'm thinking, yeah, that, that, I think that's the Aurora. And talking about the smartphone photography stuff, what I did was I quickly got my phone out and took a, a long exposure on my iPhone. And straight away, colours appeared. You could see uh, you could see greens and reds on the on the phone. So of course, the first thing I did was run and get the camera as quickly as possible. I explained to all the guests that it's the Aurora. And just as I set the camera up, it started to really kick off. It started to, to, to get brighter, to move faster. You could see these big spikes coming from the horizon and they were changing so quickly. And it was quite magical, magical to see. And advice on taking pictures of it actually is to uh, keep your exposure time down you can't have it too long so i mentioned there that you, you'd normally use maybe 10 to 30 seconds uh, when you're imaging the milky way maybe but because the aurora moves so fast my exposures were only like three seconds long and i was doing many of them so i was doing one after another continuously and that's how i was able to put it into a time lapse and produce a producing a video of the Northern Lights moving across the horizon. That's the one that was seen uh, all over the TV the next day. So, Wow, <laughs> that's incredible. And what, were the, what was the reaction from the guests like? Because then they must have been over the moon for that. Oh, they, they, they were over the moon. They absolutely loved it. And I was telling them actually how lucky they were because that night, not only did they see the Northern Lights, they got to see the moon through the telescope early in the night, and then the moon set, so the sky got dark. They saw the Milky Way, the Cygnus region I mentioned earlier, looked fantastic. They saw Jupiter, Saturn, Mars, all through the telescopes. And then they saw the Northern Lights at the end of the night. So they, they, they pretty much got everything that you, we can offer at Kielder <laughs> all in one night. So they were incredibly lucky. I mean, yeah, I told them, and they were just over the moon with, with how lucky they were. Yeah, they definitely peaked there. And as we head now into the winter months, of course, you know, uh, November, December, January, um, still a great time. Obviously, things are moving around in the night sky and uh, maybe the Milky Way starts to move off slightly. But what, what sort of things would you be looking for through the winter? What, what would be the highlights to look out for for you? I think uh, the, the, the one and only highlight for me in the winter is Orion. Orion is such a photogenic constellation. It, it's... It doesn't get too high in the sky. You see it rising in the in the southeast and it moves over to the south and it's not too high in the sky. So it's in a good position to to get images with a nice foreground and with Orion above it. And because the stars in Orion are so prominent and also they're different colours, some of them are blue, some of them are orange, and you can really pick that up on the camera. So you can kind of make Orion a bit of a feature of the image, if you like. So I do really like that. But also just the winter constellations in general are quite bright. They're easy to spot. Uh, there's a there's an asterism which is a an unofficial 
constellation in a way. It's an unofficial pattern of stars. That's what an asterism is. Uh, sometimes known as the winter hexagon or the celestial G. And it's just a big, well, it's, the, it's a big letter G made out of stars in the winter sky. And it runs through lots of different famous constellations. It, it, it starts off in... Um, I'm testing myself now. It starts off in um, Taurus and then moves up to moves up to Auriga, down into uh, Gemini, Canis Major, sorry, Canis Minor even, down to Canis Major, then into Orion. So it, if you learn that or if you find out where, that, where that is, you can learn quite a few of the different winter constellations. Ah, I quite like that. It's a nice thing. Uh, the Milky Way does disappear a little bit in winter. It is there. But the bit of the Milky Way that we're seeing in winter, which actually runs down the left-hand side of Orion, is quite faint compared to what we see uh, at the moment. So it is there, you can image it, but it's not as impressive as, as the Cygnus region that we mentioned. And what, for you, obviously you've taken some stunning images, not just in this country, but abroad as well, but what, what for you is the holy grail for astrophotography? What's that one thing that you, you, want, to, you want to nail at one point? Well, for me, and I've, I mean, I've already done it, is the, is the galactic centre. I love seeing the centre of the Milky Way galaxy. And one of the problems in the UK is that it's quite low, so you can get it. And the time to get it is normally in maybe April, uh, April, maybe May, early in the morning. I mean, like two, three, three, four in the morning, something like that. And it rises up in the southeast. But because it's so low, especially from, from northern England, if you go to the south coast of England, it's a little bit better. Um, it, it kind of gets lost amongst the, um, the, the, maybe there might be some ambient light pollution low down on the horizon or, or there might be, just because the atmosphere is much thicker low down, the, the um, light gets, uh, well, kind of the light from the Milky Way is not as visible as it would be if it was higher up. So, uh, yeah, I like to go further south. And when I say further south, I'm often, well, I've been a few times out to the Canary Islands and it's a great place to get to. It's it's only, well, it's, it, it's far enough south to get good views of the Milky Way without going long haul, without going too far. It's 28 degrees north of the equator, which is good enough to see the galactic center. And for me, that just comes out so well on a camera. And every time I take a picture of it, I'm, I'm always blown away. I could never get bored of that. So... That's it for me. But I want to do more of that in the in the future. Yeah, it's a stunning image. Well, look, thanks a lot for, for uh, giving us a few tips and uh, look forward to some more images through the winter. No worries. Thanks for having me. And you can check out some of Dan's stunning images uh, on social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, uh, and as they sometimes on the TV, they make an appearance as well, or, or even further beyond than that. Um, let's have a look at some of the events that uh, you might want to stick in your diary over the coming weeks. We've got um, a few places left in November, otherwise things are pretty booked up. There's one or two... Uh, uh, spots of availability in December, though, if you want to get something in before Christmas. We've got the Dark Cosmos, uh, Discovering New Worlds, talking about our moon as well in mid-December. And um, one or two uh, sessions for the kids uh, available as well, including Space Kids and our Young Explorers events. And we're talking about astrophotography. Um, actually, on the 18th of December, we're running an astrophotography uh, evening there, which will be a Sunday night, and there are places left on that, so maybe we we'll want to look out uh, for that. And then uh, more availability in January and February, plenty of availability there. Get on, have a look at what uh, you fancy and uh, book in, including for those Aurora Nights as well, which will be happening through uh, February. Certainly there's availability there and more astrophotography and much more besides. So get online, kilderobservatory.org to discover uh, which session you'd like to book onto and we'll hope to see you there very soon. Don't forget to check out some of our previous episodes. Uh, the most recent one before this one was all about black holes. Black Holes Explored with Professor Martin Ward. Chris Lintot, the uh, host of the BBC Sky at Night, joined us recently as well. And uh, we also uh, discussed the new James Webb Telescope, which I know has been in operation for a little while now. But uh, going back into the summer, we were looking at those first images and what they might mean for our knowledge of the universe listen to that and so much more on the previous episodes and we'll join you next month for another episode of the Kilda Observatory podcast <laughs>